In the pre-match video promo for the main event between Kota Ibushi and Kazunchika Okada at Tokyo Dome last year, there's a moment that is oddly symbolic and beautifully brilliant that goes unnoticed by the audience's eyes. That's understandable because it's a setup for things to come. In it, the G1 Climax winner Kota Ibushi stands in front of one of the gates referred to as Tori of a shrine. These shrines are part of the Shinto religion, a place that houses the gods, or Kami. It is believed through folklore that these gates are what separate our world with the spirit world. And Ibushi stands outside, staring at that world beyond. Imagine having your destiny bonded with your soul. Imagine taking on the weight of the world on your shoulders. Imagine doing what you feel is right no matter what the world thought. Imagine your emotions running all over the place guiding you. Imagine expectations burning you down, but the desire to rise to them firing you up. Imagine loving with the passion. Imagine hurting with the passion. I, of course, am running way ahead of the script. But if this story was so easy to be simply told from the beginning, this honestly wouldn't be a pro wrestling story. In film literature, there has been a long-standing concept called the audio theory. It is one of the more major philosophies when it comes to studying film language and criticism. It's how we separate the general crowd of filmmakers from the truly spectacular ones, ones that disturb the status quo and at the same time pave the way for the future. The theory talks about how there are a select few directors across the world that have a penchant for ascribing their subjective feelings onto the craft of filmmaking. This idea gives birth to a notion that while film or any other kind of art is designed to serve the masses and the business of an industry, it is also inherently personal and deeply unique to the mind behind the art. The same script held by two different filmmakers will never be the same, even if that script is followed to the line. And at its core, that is what the audio theory talks about, projecting one's personality onto a widely objective narrative. And I believe all art has this value, the desire to be the author of your craft. And the reason I'm talking about this is because pro wrestling as an art also has these kinds of authors hidden behind the facade of kayfabe. A while back I was wondering that while wrestling matches are majorly booked by professionals working behind the scene, is there something more? that the athletes bring to the forefront apart from their obvious physicality and charisma. If the stories are set backstage, are the athletes basically just actors trained to fight? These questions are not universal in any sense. They are oddly personal. I'm not trying to look down on the wrestlers or take away from their work. It's just an argument that if two wrestlers tell my story in the ring, who does the majority of the praise go to? The wrestlers or the bookers? And while this question is arguably baseless coming from a place of no real knowledge about the workings of the industry behind the scenes, it did lead me to somewhat of an answer. Like saying the same script directed by two different filmmakers will yield two completely different products. Even two wrestlers working the same narrative will yield two completely different stories. And I want to talk about one such wrestling author who thrives through putting in his subjective twists in the stories he tells. In the matches he wrestles. A surprising choice for me because I did not honestly think much about him at a deeper level this time last year. Yeah, I did know he's amazing and has been on the cusp of greatness for years now, but I guess that is his appeal, making his greatness seem mundane, ordinary. In the past seven years or so, Kota Ibushi's New Japan career has seen rivalries that are deeply infused in emotional themes themes that have been somewhat widely untouched. Well, as far as I'm concerned, and that makes sense. Kota Ibushi is by leaps and bounds a once-in-a-lifetime talent. His lifestyle and lovable quirks are unique in a sense that he seems awfully interesting from an outside glance. But the same unique quotient makes it kind of hard for us to project ourselves onto him and relate to him on a deeper level. Up until now, that was the case for me at least. For a long while, Ibushi did not stick to a singular archetype for me. Okada is the dragon that needs to be defeated. Naito is the hero around whom the events need to occur. And so on. Ibushi was the wild card. Someone who is neither meant to be defeated or the one who needs to defeat anyone. But 
he is the breakout star that people would listen to the story for. And it was only a few months back that I started to look for deeper understanding of how Ibushi works. Ibushi is not the final boss of pro wrestling, nor is he the true hero. Ibushi is just Ibushi, a perspective lost in the more grandiose and overt facets of wrestling. And I want to talk about him. Most of the major rivalries that Ibushi has had in New Japan in the past several years have been endowed in two themes, spirituality and romance. This thematic duality is represented in how much he respects his rivals and how he reacts to them for the most parts. Ibushi's matches are in general terms a performance, an elaborate execution of feelings towards his opponents, which is why there's an outright drama to everything he does. Even in his most ridiculous bouts, there's a sense of emotion. Kota Ibushi is one of the most emotional wrestlers I have had the opportunity to experience. In the way that he reacts to his opponents, tells a lot about how he feels about them. That is why he has such an intriguing chemistry with many of his rivals. Most wrestlers would generally have one or maybe two others they share a special in-ring bond with. Ibushi has close to five, depending on how you look at them at least. And in this video, I will try and cover some of those points and how Ibushi brings a unique take to each of these men that feels somewhat poignant and crucial in general human experience. In his embryonic stage, when he is slowly graduating from being a junior to a heavyweight wrestler, Ibushi is a shell of his current self in 2013, the year where he takes part in his first ever G1 Climax. Still with a junior heavyweight make, Ibushi uses his high-flying American Indie style and his trusted finisher the Phoenix Splash to gain three victories over Toriyano, Carl Anderson and Tetsuya Naito before getting a chance to come face to face with one of the men he would go on to regard as God, the Intercontinental Champion Shinsuke Nakamura. There's a caution with which Ibushi approaches the man known for his striking ability and who became symbolic with strong style. Nakamura's knees were the difference maker in this encounter and ultimately led to Ibushi's defeat in the match. Ibushi's young fire was not enough to win the match but it did not seem like winning the match was his only goal. His efforts to tough it up, even leading him to kick out of Nakamura's finisher the Bomaye at 1, the ultimate method center in pro wrestling in my opinion, came from a place of seeking acceptance and acknowledging flaws. The second and final time the two faced off, it was for the Intercontinental title at Tokyo Dome in 2015. Ibushi's attempts at bridging the gap were even stronger this time around. Using a more enhanced arsenal of kicks and strikes against the veteran, even going as far as to use Nakamura's own pomaye on him, and Nakamura kicks out at one. Although his will shined in the match, Ibushi still wasn't able to defeat Nakamura. But he does finally gain his acceptance after the match and Ibushi never looked past his striking based offense that he holds enough to develop his own spin on the Bomaye with a new finisher in the future, the Kami Goye. That's what fighting Nakamura gave him in only two encounters before Nakamura made a move to America. And we finally enter the boyhood stage of Ibushi. Arguably the most storied kinship in wrestling in the past decade was the saga of the Golden Lovers, the story of two best friends, Kenny Omega and Kota Ibushi, leading a cultural breakthrough through the tag team and eventual follow. But it is also the story of Kenny Omega more so than Kota Ibushi. Strictly talking from a storytelling point of view, the perspective we are most familiar with is Kenny's over the course of his New Japan run. And I've talked about it in length when covering Kenny Omega in an earlier video. It mirrors the cinematic narrative in the sense that there is the protagonist and then there is the love interest. But as we have covered before, perspectives in wrestling can never be singular. The duality in context is what makes wrestling unique from other kinds of art forms. Possibly why we remember this tale from Kenny's point of view is because by either design or sheer happenstance, Ibushi entails characteristics of what is referred to as a manic pixie dream girl or boy. 
The term comes up a lot in criticisms and discussions in the genre of rom-coms. The idea of the existence of a quirky character with no real goals or an arc of their own, but designed specifically for the growth of the main character. I know this is a heavy discourse that I'm not particularly confident of having right now, so just stick with me for a while. This is not a criticism of Omega and while the feelings I have right now might differ from the feelings I had back when I made the Omega video, this is just an indication of me as a person changing their views and growing up. This channel is called Deep Comes of Age, so you must stick with me while I do that every now and then. It's the beauty of growing and changing. So coming back to Ibushi, I'm not saying he never had his own goals. His goals and dreams are the catalyst for him to break out of the Golden Lovers tattoo, leaving Kenny to struggle to reel all by himself. With this, Ibushi kind of reminds me of the titular character of Summer in the movie 500 Days of Summer, which is meant to be a subversion of the MPDG trope. Summer does not stick to the story only for Tom to learn his lessons. She goes out, does her own stuff, leaving Tom to have to come to terms. Us relating to Kenny is by and far remarkably similar to how majority of the audience related to Tom when the movie first came out. You just do what you want, don't you? Ibushi and Kenny don't have a spectacular fallout of the ages. They just stopped tagging when Sibushi started getting more and more opportunities in the heavyweight division. And he doesn't look back. He grows out of a wonderful relationship and develops through his bouts with Nakamura and slowly forming an equally deep bond with Naito. The point being, he grows out of the mutual breakup a healthier individual, a more complete individual, so to say. While Omega keeps hurting inside and does everything as a reaction to his breakup, developing a more toxic growth pattern. Ibushi is the small town kid full of dreams who graduates to a uni and experiences the world that a small town could not offer. Kenny was a heartbroken partner who stays back for a year, experiencing that world secondhand through his ex. True to the trope, one of Ibushi's quirk involved him never sticking to a single place long enough. He loved his vagabond life, switching between DDT and New Japan Pro Wrestling until 2016 where the stress caught up to his body and he finally left to do his own thing. Like fighting on the streets, to wrestling for WWE, all in the same goddamn break. Ibushi's and Kenny's parts too cross once again in the future as we all know. But his time apart sparked an interesting relationship so to say, with another man that on paper seemed equally suited to be a foil to Ibushi. Tetsuya Naito was forced through the New Japan Dojo and by 2013, was being built as a stardust genius, the next big star. Both Naito and Ibushi are of the same age but reached this point through hugely different paths, both using a variation of the same cox screw out as their finishes, and both at a stage of wanting to prove something. And that desire fueled them when they first encountered each other in the 2013 G1 Climax. Ibushi won the match, but Naito would go on to win the actual tournament. Ibushi would go on to become a wildcard fan favorite, and Naito would get rejected by the same fans and get demoted to the semi main event spot at Tokyo Dome. The match, however, turns out to be crucial for both men. A far cry from what their matches would eventually become about. We'll talk about that years down the line. It starts out slow with technical beats but steadily becomes a framework for their chemistry in the future. More importantly, they both show emotion and react to them. Naito shows an unorthodox spark for hurting Ibushi's knee, even performing a top rope drop kick, pin pointed at it, and then goes on to smile about what he had accomplished. He keeps going after his knee and when Ibushi shows his own aggression, Naito responds by inviting him to take out the aggressions on him and fight on an equal footing. And Ibushi cares for stuff like this. As we would come to understand, the way his opponents react to murder Ibushi influences the way he feels towards them. If I were to join analogy, this G1 match with Naito feels like a first university project, assigned with a partner that you don't really know, but start to learn how to work together in this strange new environment. Their next match is a further evolution of their fighting philosophy. Unlike last time, it starts out really fast, the way you'd expect Naito to push the gas. Crowd-pleasing fan service, right? If the last match was about becoming familiar with each other, 
this one becomes a prototype for things to come for these two like when naito performs a dangerous reverse how you can run off from the second rope that drops ibushi onto his freaking neck and ibushi introducing the world to his bastard driver when naito goes for a signature wheel barrel roll up pin dropping him on his neck too as early as the crowd pleasing was teased the notion was discarded by both who communicated with passion in a dimension of their own developing a signature move of his own off of a signature move of naito himself is the level of thought ibushi put towards naito ibushi wins the match and goes on to win the new japan cup in 2015 their budding kinship gains another layer of lightness as when it's time for ibushi to partner with someone against ad styles and bullet club member he chooses naito why this is interesting to me is because the partner styles chooses for one of these road show matches is Naito's former partner from his No Limit tag team, Yujiro Takahashi. Both Ibushi and Naito face their symbols of separation in that Kenny is by now a Bullet Club member as well. Both must come face to face with their hosts and they have each other by their side as they do it. And for any kind of story, that strengthens the bond at the very least. While Naito had already faced betrayal before, for Ibushi, the notion of betrayal comes head on at the show Invasion Attack. where Kenny distracts him enough for Styles to gain the upper hand and win the match. As Ibushi reels from this loss, this phase begins to reach its climax in the year's G1 tournament. For starters, Ibushi faces a completely revamped Naito. Gone was the passionate starry-eyed wrestler and in was the calm and collected Paddy, who we'd go on to adopt as the ungovernable. Ibushi has the same match, albeit with a different man. Naito does not match Ibushi's impatience in wanting to fight him, as he fools around outside the ring taunting Ibushi instead. Naito wins the match with the introduction of his new finisher Destino, as he discards the Stardust Press, now finally surpassing his rival, even performing a post-match beatdown for good measure. This G1 is even more so a breakthrough for Ibushi, as he avenges his previous loss by defeating AJ Styles, and even gets a chance to stand across the man. He deems as the pinnacle of the sport, his wrestling god, the ace Hiroshi Tanahashi. Like confronting a derailed soul who had lost focus, Tanahashi opens the year's G1 tournament by reminding Ibushi of the cheers of the fans surrounding the arena, the chance for the ace. This is what it's about. Unlike Nakamura, Tanahashi plays a more active role. in addressing Ibushi with a barrage of attacks to his knee, forcing the youngster to fire up with passion. Ibushi retaliates with kicks and palm strikes only for Tanahashi to easily counter everything, giving Ibushi time to steadily collect himself. The veteran ultimately is on a whole different level at this stage and beats Ibushi with one high fly flow. Nakamura did not acknowledge Ibushi after their first match was over, but Tanahashi not only picks him up, he pats Ibushi on the head. Like a true senpai, Ibushi accepts the blessing with a final show of respect as he bows down to Tanahashi while leaving the arena, tears in his eyes. Later that year, Ibushi suffers injuries due to the grueling schedule and resigns from New Japan and DDT, where he was put in double duty. And with this, we close the chapter in his career before moving on to the next. Ibushi seemed to have been on a healthy course, finding common ground with a partner. and every now and then coming in contact with a higher DD to course correct but things do not always remain stable in life true balance can only be attained after going through hardships the next phase is not so much about external battles that they are about go work months the two roads that eventually appear in front of you in your journey and you end up having to make a choice for the sake of you and no one else The year 2016 is a little tough on Ibushi. He takes time away from the limelight to perform at smaller indie shows and even shows up in WWE for a small stint. Meanwhile, in New Japan, Kenny Omega quickly ascends to the top of the ladder by not only participating in the G1 but going on to win it in his very first attempt, something that Ibushi couldn't do yet. Slowly and steadily, the focus shifts towards Kenny as he becomes more and more outward with his feelings. 
2017 was advertised as the big return year for Ibushi during G1 Climax. Kenny makes his feelings clear about wanting to face Ibushi in the finals, going as far as admitting it's the only way they could ever meet. Ibushi's first match after returning for the first time in two years is against an awfully familiar man. Tetsuya Naito not only stands in the way of Ibushi winning the tournament, but also very much in the way of Kenny and Ibushi meeting in the finals. Already very vocal about Ibushi not taking wrestling seriously enough to stick in New Japan, but playing this game with Omega. Naito felt it was disrespectful for him to not only disregard the fighting spirit, but also his destiny. It was clear, Ibushi was standing in front of Naito's destiny, and Naito was standing in front of Ibushi's. The match starts in typical tranquilo fashion as Naito begins to play head games calling out to the emotional Ibushi to make mistakes. Ibushi, however, retaliates with brutal kicks to his chest. If Naito wasn't going to be competitive as per Ibushi's liking, Ibushi was willing to beat the fight out for him. The match they go on to have is a spectacle of physicality. Naito brings a fight and more. They target each other's necks with brutal moves as Naito brings back the reverse runner off the second rope while Ibushi plants a vicious looking pile driver, also from the second rope. Eventually though, Naito crushes Ibushi with his Cestino and goes on to beat even Kenny in the finals to secure the G1 win, claiming his destiny to be just that stronger than the lovers spawned. But as Ibushi proved his spot back in New Japan to all his doubters with this match, he was yet to impress the one person who would matter the most. Ibushi secured a G1 win over Tanahashi, who was at the time the Intercontinental Champion. He beats him with the introduction of a new finisher, a knee to face that calls back to the Bomae, but that Kamigoye. Tanahashi, in turn, handpicks Ibushi himself to challenge for the same title Ibushi failed to win against Nakamura at the US Power Struggle. The championship that would symbolize his place among his two idols indicated how much it would mean for him to hold it. Arguably Ibushi's most important match in New Japan up to that point. It was perhaps this reason that Tanahashi needed Ibushi to step up to his innate potential. This is the turning point where Ibushi must come face to face with the two ropes. Either remain a journeyman for the rest of his life and act on whims, or rise up to the level of greatness that not many have to promise for. If he yearns for competition so much, he needs to focus. From callbacks to Nakamura to heavy palm strikes targeted at the heart of Tanahashi, Ibushi brings a fight. If he had already proven his place, he now needs to prove his will. But Tanahashi gets back up fighting fire with fire, planting open palms onto Ibushi's face. Now was not the time to run but embrace it. With two high flyer flows, Tanahashi puts him down after a grueling battle. Something that has always felt as intriguing as Ibushi's matches are Ibushi's post-match moments. Eyes full of tears at the thought of feeling his idol, he is comforted by Tanahashi who picks him up to his feet. As they stand across each other, Ibushi lunges towards Tanahashi and gives him a hug for believing in him. For a while, it seems like the path has been cleared. But through a twist of fate and unabashed desires, Ibushi finds himself once again, standing before Kenny. Before the match with Tanahashi, Ibushi proclaims how he wanted to put the Intercontinental title on the line at Wrestle Kingdom and battle once again with Shinsuke Nakamura, who had by then become a WWE staple. Although it's a whimsical bit to transcend boundaries and unite the wrestling world, somehow, I do feel it's got more to do with Kenny's Tokyo Dome match with Chris Jericho, a WWE lifer at the time. Perhaps these impulsive whims for what Tanahashi wanted to truly eradicate out of Ibushi's head. These philosophies would reach its apex the following year in 2018, the year of the return of the Golden Lovers. After a heartwarming reunion for the ages, Kenny and Ibushi become the talk of the town, the sweet romance that had fans rooting for them all over the world. With Ibushi, Omega now has finally reached the point where he has all the desired tools to finish his blog. He's at the end of his journey as he finally defeats his dragon Okada for the heavyweight championship. Ibushi is the physical form of the metaphysical elixir that Kenny obtains to win the prize. It is a natural conclusion of his story. 
his story while one part of the journey was complete it was time to finally write the chapter of mushi accomplishing something that he had never done before winning the g1 climax 2018 omega once again proclaims the golden lovers to meet at the top of the world together when they meet even to be alone with ibushi winning the tournament it was written on the walls ibushi even meets naito once again who had been particularly harsh about ibushi playing second fiddle in a tag team but what's a second love in the face of a reignited first ibushi defeats naito to clear his path to kenny himself who was the only person standing in the way of the tournament finals the farthest that ibushi had ever reached This is the first time in 6 years that these two wrestle each other. Their last match happening before everything that we've talked about happened. A distraught Kenny attempting to hold on to an Ibushi who was ready to fly off. Kenny meets these feelings of ineptitude head on with anger, and Ibushi deals with him the only way he knows. Beating the shit out of him. Going back and watching this match made me realize something about Ibushi. He never really thinks about physical things such as titles or wins when he is fighting. His yearning for competition is what motivates him. He fights with no regrets, to the point where he seems almost classy-eyed towards his surroundings. This is why it's so astonishing to see Ibushi feeling guilt over winning the match, heartbroken over what he's had to do to his best friend. Their 2018 match, however. is a complete role reversal from when Ibushi was above a young and impressionable Omega. This time it's Kenny who's at the top and Ibushi who is the underdog. These two fight with honor, move for move, showcasing how much they've matured as wrestlers and as humans as this time there are no ill feelings between the two. Ibushi pins Kenny after a no regrets battle to move a step forward towards his destiny. The finals of the tournament await. and who should be on the other end well it is hiroshi tanahashi albeit not in his prime but he looks for one more chance at glory it was time for ibushi to finally conquer over him to go to tokyo dome and wrestle his golden lover it's interesting to me how the previous year it was naito who stood in the way of the golden lovers and this year it is tanahashi playing the foil almost like a spiritual message to ibushi his one final roar to not only rise to the top but one final flash to show ibushi the guiding light against all the odds in the world ibushi is defeated by the ailing ace setting him up for a match with kenny instead at tokyo dome at the time it did not make a shadow of a sense but it was hard to tell if it would be a foreshadow for the year to come After the match, Ibushi stands across Tanahashi, but there is the same kind of regret on his face as back in 2012. He wants to go in for a hug, but probably because of Kenny's presence, or maybe feeling apologetic about the choice he made after being admonished by his god, he falls back and leaves the ace to celebrate. Think about that time you got back with Nix, after repeatedly being advised how it was a bad idea. and clouded by a moment of nostalgia you lose your path it takes omega leaving to start his own promotion AEW for Ibushi to find his way back to what he genuinely wants to everyone's shock Kota Ibushi reveals that he plans to stick to New Japan to fulfill his idea of a united wrestling world A lot of fans including myself had a hard time coming to terms with this development but I think looking back at it I could respect Ibushi's choice to do so talking out of storyline terms or within it I do acknowledge how many feel that had Kenny asked Ibushi to come he would go without a second thought but somehow thinking that plays into the same plot driven love interest character trope like taking that ounce of agency from Ibushi away by saying he stayed in New Japan only because Kenny didn't ask him to come and wanted him to follow his dreams. This is the only time I'll critique this theory, so don't at me. What's intriguing is that Tanahashi of all people is the one to take the reins from Omega. Like saying a guardian spirit showing light to a lost soul. And to me, that's beautiful. After all these years, Ibushi can finally say he is truly unabashedly 
free of costs. Some relationships, no matter how treasured, are just not meant to be. Lord knows I'm one to talk. That's kind of out of context, but I'm sure you can relate because it's that sort of a sentiment. What we see in movies, what we feel in real life, is what I now realize this was all about. From here on out, the story flips a switch in his head. 2019 is a sort of breakthrough year that Ibushi had yearned for. From winning the Intercontinental Championship to finally winning the G1 Climax and punching a ticket to the Tokyo Dome main event. It's also the year where he goes unhinged and we finally, finally get to talk about Ibushi and Naito. His first match since Tokyo Dome was the inaugural round of the New Japan Cup against the ungovernable one. And it introduced me to one of my favorite wrestling chemistries, period. If Kenny and Ibushi is a teen coming of age romance, Naito and Ibushi is a f***ing sex scandal. The two college freshmen who sparked a little when they were boys grew up to go different paths, break their hearts, fall down and end up in each other's sights. It's the Barney and Robin to Golden Lovers Ted and Robin. And I am ashamed of a How I Met Your Mother reference in 2021, but who cares, that's what I think. It's highlighted by both in interviews, the genuine happiness they feel fighting each other. There's a propensity for danger that only at times Naito and Ibushi seem to be enjoying. Like a true blue scandal, the two went together are scorned by people and scholars alike. Some reviewers refusing to even rate their match because of their ability to break each other at every encounter. Almost like being disowned by the world, Ibushi and Naito genuinely fight with each other for themselves. To add a little poetry to their duels, their rivalries entangled deeply with the Intercontinental Championship and what it meant for both of them. Naito was truly the foil to Ibushi when it came to the title. The same championship that was held by his gods Nakamura and Tanahashi was disparaged in the hands of Naito. What is a god to a non-believer, right? Naito's absolute contempt towards the title came from once being denied and replaced by the very two men Nakamura and Tanahashi at the main event at Tokyo Dome for the very same title. Holding the same championship meant looking at the reason for his failure in the eyes. Ibushi wished to bring the respect back to the championship that was tarnished by Naito and the various times he tried to malign it. A worshipper versus an atheist. The matches though are outside the bounds of a storyline. The title is just an excuse to an extent. The trilogy of matches begins with Ibushi getting a win over Naito in the New Japan Cup. From then on, we see Naito reeling in Ibushi for the title match. Ibushi was the only person he wanted to fight on G1 Supercard being held at the Madison Square Garden. There's a dynamic difference in how these two react to each other now than how they did in the previous phases. Like earlier, Naito used to do the tranquilo taunt aimed at Ibushi at the start of the match, but now when he does it, it is more in conjunction with Ibushi hitting a counter pose like rhythmically balancing out one another. How Naito would intentionally give out a smile before sadistically drilling Ibushi with one of the insanely brutal moves they would become famous for. In these, it's a message that these two give to the fans, not each other. While they are fighting, they ultimately are on the same team, and the crowd is there to react to them. It's a level of tuning that only few could hope to achieve. Ibushi beats Naito to finally win the championship he so wanted to win, and within days, is challenged back by Naito at the Dominion show. Arguably their most brutal encounter to the date. It's a testament to the amount of trust these two guys place on each other when letting them perform career-ending moves on themselves. Not in a bit to hurt each other, but to play the audience in the palm of their hands. But there's a moment where all the curtains are pulled down on their act. At the end of the third match of their trilogy, when Naito pins Ibushi, we see him holding his hand, both lying at the edge of consciousness. The love was never visible to our eyes before and would not happen again for a while. While Ibushi takes a while to snap back, still thinking the match is not over, Naito gets back to his sanity sooner as he arrogantly stomps Ibushi's head with the title in his hand. 
not as a show of disrespect to the man, but to play the audience once again for one final time. Calling back to that 2015 match when Naito beat up Ibushi after winning his first match against him. Like a friendly jab that just so happens to include deadly attacks to the neck. Naito goes onward on his quest to become double champion at Tokyo Dome, while Ibushi goes on to win the UST on Climax. Finally, after all these years. In a heartwarming moment of clarity, he proclaims to the fans and to New Japan that he will never leave them again and run away from his responsibilities. These responsibilities included upholding the prestige of the company by also buying to become double champion. But things ultimately don't stay as hopeful. Wrestle Kingdom is a time where Ibushi fell down his darkest pit yet, when he is not only defeated by Okada, the heavyweight champion at the time, but has also been dealt the final death blow by G. White, who beats Ibushi on day two of the show, making him come out at the last place in a double gold dash. Among the four, Naito having won it and fulfilling his destiny on the other end. The Shinto shrine that Ibushi was eyeing at the start of this video becomes all but a taunt, an unachievable dream at the end of the day. And Ibushi is devastated. The switch that was flipped at the start of 2019 has seemed to completely break at the start of 2020. Deciding to find himself and take some time off from singles competition, Ibushi begins tagging with Tanahashi, a perfect partner for him. Although this time, a vastly different dynamic. Tanahashi by now is far from the ace that he once was. An ailing legend grasping for a little more time to shine, having to come to terms with the cons of a human body. Something he cannot change. Tanahashi and Ibushi find solace in each other. Their partnership is a feel-good exploration of two souls, defeated either by losses or age, finding meaning and purpose in themselves. Far from the sex capades and teen romances, Ibushi finally settles down to commit to a spiritual ally. Kind of like a forbidden love forged through age gaps and wholly different life virtues. But they are happy together even going so far as to win the tag team championships in the Gorillas of Destiny in February. The story they tell from here on is heartbreaking at best and worrying at worst. Having gone without a single defense of the title for three months owing to the pandemic, they go in to face Taichi and Zack Sabre Jr., both worthy singles competitors, with Taichi having beat Bushi and Tanahashi in singles matches in the year's New Japan Cup. Tanahashi itching to redeem himself for growing weaker by the day and eating pinfalls for the team, feels he is bringing Ibushi down with him. And Ibushi this time plays the role of the support, the tools with which the redemption is possible. But they lose the titles, owing to the opponents brutalizing Tanahashi's already weakened knees. The team begins a slow disintegration leading to doubts over whether Tanahashi could still hang. Ibushi as a teammate and as a competitor is torn between having to pick up a partner who is falling behind or continue his path for glory alone. There is a sort of symbolic imagery in their energy that borders on sexual at times. The themes are there. Bushi realizes that Tanahashi can no longer provide him what he needs, and he must find a way to come to terms. Just Tanahashi's undying will is not enough. And there's some amount of toxicity in this. Unrealizing to what he is doing to his partner on an emotional level, Ibushi starts hurting Tanahashi instead of understanding what he is going through. This comes to a fitting crescendo at Summer Struggle when the two are beaten again by Taichi and Zack, hammering the final nail in the coffin. It looks like something horrible is going to take place but Ibushi holds it together, shouldering Tanahashi as he struggles to get back up to his feet. The backstage comments section is a room filled with regret and awkward silence. Both know they cannot go on like this. The G1 was approaching and they amicably break up, with Tanahashi promising to get back up in the best shape so they could team up again. Ibushi, while well-meaning, deals a final blow to Tanahashi, promising him they would team up again for sure, if Tanahashi could rise up to his level. And the sadness in Tanahashi's eyes hearing that is glaring. He hides it with words of valor 
but it is apparent that while Ibushi did not physically turn on him after the defeat, he does emotionally destroy the man. They both separate, promising each other to meet in the finals of the G1. Ibushi does so and goes on to win his second G1 in a row. Tanahashi does not even come close to the finals. Destroyed in every sense of the word, he is left in a worse off state than before the two partnered up. Someone is always left behind. This is also the G1 that sees Ibushi take his grace to another level. After being denied at the start of the year and destroying his squad, surpassing him physically and mentally, Ibushi proclaims to the world that after winning the G1, he would become God. From worshipping to surpassing to becoming one is the story foreshadowed in that pre match video promo. If one were to notice, there are certain parallels to the kinds of fear both Ibushi and Omega have had in 2020. Both became tag champs and both their respective partners were made to cross hurdles and ghosts to redeem themselves only to be discarded by them. If Ibushi found it in him to shoulder Tanahashi at the last second, Omega outright denied Adam Page that shoulder before breaking up with him. Omega goes on to become his own version of God by dubbing himself a belt collector. A term that was jokingly slipped by Ibushi himself during an interview with Tanahashi in March. Clearly a sign of how their parts have been symmetrical throughout this year, with Omega mirroring the same patterns as Ibushi, symbolic of his inability to move on. Ibushi, however, has different needs, his final road being met by one final hurdle, our last case for Ibushi's misadventures. His frustrations with Tanahashi were built through him not being competitive enough. It is what Ibushi has yearned for throughout all these years. Competition is symbolic of intimacy for him. This is the only year where he has been left alone by Naito, with no Omega in his horizon and no Tanahashi to slap it out of him. Craving for that level of intimacy, he is reeled in by that one person lurking in the shadows waiting for Ibushi to be mentally weakened and emotionally unstable enough before hooking him in. Jay White is the ideological antagonist to Ibushi's passion for pain, a thorn by his side for some time having put the final nail in Ibushi's coffin at Tokyo Dome that year and even defeating him in one of the G1 block matches. Deep from the subconscious emerges Jay White to challenge Ibushi for the G1 climax and the main event rights, right after the finals had ended. Like a scene reminiscent of an old trauma, they gulp down on their drinks and make a pact to meet at Baba's struggle. It is this desperation, or you could call it naivete, that becomes Ibushi's undoing. Having been promised a battle to quench the thirst in his heart, what he instead gets is his heart trampled and betrayed. Jay cheats on Ibushi, literally and metaphorically. While Ibushi invites his opponents to exploit the weakened knees and neck, Jay decides to target his core, something that baffles us. Jay White is not your usual puro enthusiast with the fighting spirit. He scorns at the idea of pain and passion and is realistic and strategic in his approach to battles. It was Ibushi's foolishness that thought Jay would fight his kind of match. The attacks with the core pay off as at the middle stage of the fight where the action doesn't even begin to pick up, Jay covers Ibushi and uses the middle ropes to hold him down for the three count. The match is over and Ibushi loses just like that. Ibushi is cheated out of his destiny, being won up once again by G. White, leaving him empty handed. Why I decided to make this video now was because this felt like the proper time that most of these entanglements that Ibushi has found himself in would reach their apex. Fate gives him another chance when the champion Naito himself recognizes Ibushi as the rightful challenger to him on day 1 of Wrestle Kingdom 15. Acknowledging their chemistry together, he finds no other befitting opponent at the grand stage of them all, finally giving them the platform to showcase their brand of wrestling. With of course, Jay White again waiting to swoop the rug from under their feet as he waits for one of these two battle wounded fighters to make tonight to and face a fresh J. It is a bittersweet close to the chapter of Naito and Ibushi as they wrestle to their heart's content and Ibushi finally comes out on top, winning both the Intercontinental and the Heavyweight Championship 
from a very fitting rival. Naito, who has always played up to the crowd, rids himself of all the pretenses and hands the belts to Ibushi as an acknowledgement to each other, to their shared history, to their bromance, to their rivalry. And this finally opens a path for Ibushi to write a home and take responsibility. His match with Jay becomes the longest Tokyo Dome main event of all time, as Jay is forced to have Ibushi's match with nowhere to run this time. Ibushi finally bests Jay White in a battle fitting for a competitor like him and successfully defends his titles. And the prophecy of him becoming God finally comes true. There is a deep sense of companionship that runs through each of these rivalries and partnerships and that is the essence of Ibushi's matches. Companionship, his spirituality, his romance are just motifs for it. And pain is probably the most important one of them. There is something unique about the way we are made to believe in Ibushi's pain and how he unleashes it on others. In that, the emotional and physical pain are somewhat mirrored in a sense. His emotional stoic and his propensity to not feel as much hurt as he makes out onto others is translated in how he is perceived to be made of brick that people just find impossibly hard to physically break. His pain threshold is stupidly off the charts and that relates to his emotional strength as well. A short tangent could be opened about his murder Ibushi state as well. Often in matches, when pushed to a level far enough, Ibushi goes into a dangerous state of mind where he is totally impervious to pain no matter how hard he is hit. He just walks straight on and deals heavy punishment to whoever stands opposite him. And the way many people react to this state is also unique to their relationship with him. Tanahashi looks head on into his eyes and slaps him hard. Naito teases and almost always gets one over him. And Jay just simply avoids it and lays down playing possum because he does not let emotion rule him, frustrating Ibushi even more. While his journey is far from over, Ibushi has managed to reach a peak very few manage to do. And he does so by telling a unique story all along the way. There is something to be said about finding a man in his late 30s going through different phases of love exciting and relatable. The cynical minded among us would probably scorn and they would have a valid reason to do so. There is obviously a point to be made about how we try to find profound meaning in the media we consume and how it correlates to our perception of how others would see us. Wrestling is not awesome because of long term or calculated plots and stories. Wrestling is awesome because you and I find it to be awesome. I was able to project my feelings onto Kota Ibushi because I felt like I was in Omega's place. Looking at him treat Adam Page in storyline in a way that he felt maybe he was treated by Ibushi kinda hits home because of my own ill dealings going to heartbreak. Finding myself to be able to think about Ibushi's perspective is honestly just an effort to empathize with the feelings of someone who has been able to move on. Imagining having our destiny born into the soul mood. Imagining taking on the weight of the world on our shoulders. Imagining doing what we feel is right, no matter what the world thought. Imagining our emotions running over the place, guiding us. Imagining expectations burning us down, but the desire to rise to them, firing us up. Imagining loving with a passion. Imagining hurting with a passion. These all feel like otherworldly claims that only seem to be imaginable in an epic, until they do not until they feel right at home, because it is human for them to do so. These are universal ideas fitting right into our small and menial lives, just worded like an epic. While we all are different with varied experiences, these ideas are what bind us to each other, no matter when we were born or where we live. No matter if they are experienced by a 38-year-old wrestler who happens to be so directionless, he finds himself lost when alone. And that is a bizarre appeal of really any art. I don't think it will be an exaggeration to say making this video was a challenge at every step of the way. For starters, 
this was not a topic I was confident to pick up really because of its whimsical nature. So I was really proud when I finished writing the script almost two months back and was equally scared of the length, majorly because I promised myself not to use images or videos from New Japan. I think you all know by now that some of my videos have been missing from my channel. And that's because last month I was striped in my Naito video got deleted. So dealing with that blow was not the nicest of motivations that I could get before starting work for a new video after almost four months of break. I lost all my views and all your comments that I loved reading and responding to and the only thing keeping me going was this idea that I did not lose everything. I still have over 350 subscribers and that's really amazing. You guys stuck around and you probably waited a really long time and that is absolutely amazing to me. I appreciate you all with every ounce of my heart and also apologize for not being very regular with all the efforts that would go into making these videos. But I will try and keep up. I feel immense catharsis uploading this mammoth pain of a video and sharing my three months of work with you guys. Before ending, let me give a shout out to a couple of really sweet guys that ease some of the pressure off of me. Anjan, aka the Alpha Artist, does some killer art on his YouTube where he has uploaded some amazing stuff like his latest piece on Young Bucks and Kenny Omega. He also gave me some much needed company on Instagram where I would put up updates to my art process. Please do give the Alpha Artist a subscribe for all his efforts and artwork. He's much, much, much better than I am, honestly. Also, Marwan on Twitter has been really sweet, making some of his own art for me to use in the video. And I think they're damn cool. It's an awesome design. If you're on Twitter, definitely go and vibe with them. From the bottom of my heart, thank you, Marwan. If any one of you would also like to contribute some art that you do for my videos and channel going forward, I request you to just get in touch and I would love to shout you out as well. Hopefully, see you guys really soon. Please also do me a favor and like this video and share this just to get some of that traffic back from the past. It really mean a lot to me. Thank you so much for watching. See you around. Okay, bye.